join me in our prayer of the day, which is found in your bulletin. Let us pray together. Holy God, all lives are yours, and you do not seek the death of any sinner. Renew our hearts, refresh our spirits, and help us walk in your holy way, that we may welcome the impartiality of your judgment and accept your all-embracing goodness. Through Jesus Christ, amen. What do you think? There was a person who thought she had done nothing wrong, but whose heart is changed by God's grace and admits her mistakes. Another is always apologizing, but keeps on doing the same things over and over. Which one is faithful to God's desires for us? Let us pause for a moment to think about this question and then pray together. Let us pray our prayer of confession. Righteous God, we confess that we have not lived as your obedient children. We have honored you with our words, but we have denied you with our actions. We have not pursued the mind of Christ, who took the form of a servant, for we have acted with selfish ambition. We have put our interests before the interests of others and have not regarded them in humility. Let us conclude our prayer of confession together. Forgive us our arrogance. Awaken our hearts to sincere repentance and enable us to will and to work for your good pleasure. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. Listen, this be firmly planted in your minds. God loves you. God forgives you. God strengthens you for service. Make us passionate to serve. Make us, make us eager to forgive. Make us love. Make us better lovers of the world. Thanks be to God. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. you. Do not, not let, let me put to shame. Don't let my, don't let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame, but shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me the grace, Lord. Teach me the path. Guide me. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he shall He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. Our second scripture reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 23 through 32. We will be reading in unison. Let us read the word of the Lord together. 
Jesus entered the temple courts, and while he was teaching, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked. And who gave you this authority? Jesus replied, I will also ask you one question. If you answer me, I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, where did it come from? Was it from heaven or of human origin? They discussed it among themselves and said, If we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the people, for they call that John is a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he says, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went first to his son and said, son, go to work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered, but later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir, but he did not go. Which of the two did what the father wanted? The first they answered. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. For John came to you to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe this. These end some of our scripture readings. Our last reading is from the Epistle to the Philippians. I will be reading from chapter 2, verses 1 to 13. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness, tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and one in mind. Not do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others <coughs> above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ who, being the very nature God, nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to, to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Okay.
religions or spiritual traditions, Buddhism, for example, adherents are encouraged to meditate, and as they do, empty their minds. The goal is to achieve what the Buddhist, Buddha himself was said to have achieved, enlightenment. Some people who are successful at meditation become blank slates, opening themselves to some higher truth. Truth be called occasionally. The higher truth is simply that they need some sleep, and meditation slows down their brain and hearts enough to put them to sleep. But many people find much benefits in meditation. It turns out that there is a difference between what serious, unsleepy Buddhists mean by emptying themselves in meditation and what Christians who pay attention to the passage we read today from Philippians mean by the idea of Christ's own self-emptying, an emptying that Christian theology calls kenosis. The late Dr. Rewata Gama, a prominent Buddhist monk and noted scholar from what was once formerly Burma, once explained this difference at a Buddhist Christian conference in London in 1993. There is, he said, a major difference here between Buddhism and Christianity. In Buddhism, one can become a Buddha in the realization of emptiness. But in Christianity, one cannot say that one can become a Christ. Rather, this Christian realization is a participation in Christ's redemptive kenosis. Therefore, one does not become a Christ in the same way one becomes a Buddha. Yet we Christians are called to be Christ for one another, to be the hands, the feet, the heart of the resurrected Christ in our wounded world. The good news is that the beautiful hope, the hymn that is a major part of this passage we read today from Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, Philippi can help us understand how Christ's own self-emptying, his kenosis, can show us how we are to act as Christ for others. One simple way of putting it, maybe it's too simple, is that we empty ourselves so that we can be filled with the spirit of the living Christ. This is similar to what we Christians say about baptism, which is that we die to ourselves so we can put on Christ Jesus. In other words, we are removed from ourselves whatever is preventing us from living fully as Christ's disciples. We set aside our ego, our desire for power and wealth, our self-centeredness, our temptation to sacrifice the well-being of others for our own well-being. We do our best, in other words, to kick evil instincts to the curb and listen to our better angels. Only then are we empty enough to make space for Christ to live in us, with us, for us, not for our own gain, but so we may become instruments of his peace, his love, and channels of his grace. Biblical scholars recognize that a hymn that the Apostle Paul has included in this part of the letter to the Philippians begin with a prelude in verse 5, which says, Let the same mind be in you that is in Christ Jesus. Do you see the idea of emptying of kenosis here? Do, do your best to replace your own scrambled, inactive, unruly mind with the love focused mind of Christ. Who was Christ? Ah, now that comes the fullness of the hymn. It is a remarkable and beautiful passage, and we would do well to hear that section again. But this time, I want to read it from The Message by Eugene Peterson. Now you need to realize, this is a paraphrase of the original scripture. 
not a translation. We have equivalent equal status with God, but didn't think, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and looked on the, took on the status of a slave, becoming human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfish, obedient death and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far beyond anyone or anything ever, so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all, to the glorious honor of God the Father. Now that is a paraphrase of exactly what I read from Scripture and what you have from Scripture. You see, it is quite different when you read a paraphrase, but often it seems to be simpler to understand. That friend is what a theological, that friends is what theological calls high Christology which is to say that it reflects a properly altered that view of this lovely servant, Jesus, who was so very lonely, who was both fully, fully human and fully divine. The hymn, which we're not singing today, focuses, of course, on the divine. You can find other examples of high Christology in the New Testament, including what may, may be the most well-known one in the opening of the book of John, which describes Christ as the word of God, a word which is and was God. The Apostle Paul, as we know, sometimes wrote in complicated, meandering sentences, at least when the original Greek is translated into English, perhaps because the Greek version itself is complex and wandering. So far, it is fair to ask where these gorgeous words from this hymn were original to Paul. Many scholars would answer this way. Well, probably not. The late and great Catholic scholar, Father Raymond E. Brown, writes this. Most think that Paul wrote, but did not create these lines. They are probably a pre-Pauline hymn that the Philippians knew and that Paul may have taught them at the time of his first visit. It is not clear, Brown writes, whether the hymn originally was written in Greek or in Aramaic, which was the language Jesus spoke. In either case, Brown says the meaning is clear. The Philippians are to be the mind of a Christ who showed that the way to God is not by grasping at a higher place on the ladder, but by becoming humbly obedient to God, even unto death on the cross. See what a paradoxical and difficult religion Christianity can be? We are to become like Jesus, who was God incarnate by becoming servants. To become filled with the spirit of Christ we must empty ourselves, not giving away our souls or spirit, but getting rid of those aspects of ourselves that would compete with Christ for space within our hearts and minds. Jesus said it plainly. If you want to be a leader, become a servant. It is a wildly counterculture idea in our time when bookstores, physical and online, are filled with volumes urging us to watch out for number one, to crawl over others on our way to the top. But servanthood is the core of Christianity. 
It is one of the reasons it is such a hard faith to live out in authentic ways. By the way, when Jesus speaks to us about being servants, he does not limit that to people in the pews. It is also meant to apply to church leaders, including people whose job it is to interpret scriptures and sermons. The preachers praise the idea of having a servant's heart, but then, in the rest of their ministry, act as if they have all the answers and that there is no need to challenge their wisdom. Well, can you say the word hypocrisy? It is just such hypocrisy that drives people out of the church. Those of you that attend my book club know how often I don't know something and we have to go and research for the following week. So uh, I definitely don't know everything, but I, I try hard to give you the word of God. That is the thing about te the teachings of Jesus, including his words about servanthood. They apply to everyone who claims to be a Christ follower, from the newest church member to the most seasoned pastor who may, who may be dressed as Reverend Doctor. When reading the book of Philippians, it helps to know that Paul offers instructions concerning a dispute between two church leaders, both women, by the way, identified in chapter 4 as Eurodia and Sintetch. Paul does not tell us what the dispute was about, but he knows it is causing trouble in the fledgling church and urges the women to move toward reconciliation and unity. Each of them, in other words, is being asked to empty herself that, so that she can be filled with the generative spirit of the living Christ. Indeed, Paul tells them how to do that when he writes this. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So what is Paul asking us to empty out so that we can concentrate on that list I just read? Whatever is false, whatever is dishonorable, whatever is unjust, whatever is impure, whatever is displeased and not worthy of praise. Imagine what our politics, our churches, our economic system, our very world would be like if only we took Paul's advice. So friends, let us empty ourselves of what distorts life, of what dishonors God, let us be filled with the life-giving spirit of the God who loves us and calls us to live in the light. May it be so. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our hymn of response is the old rugged cross, so let's stand and lift up our voices. <laughs>
we believe by reciting, saying the Nicene Creed found in your bulletin. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified as a conscious pilot. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in the court of the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world. With grateful hearts, let us offer our gifts, trusting in God's goodness. worldwide communion, we gather at God's table, joining with disciples of Christ in many lands and places. This table is for all people. 
Christ invited rich and poor, male and female, sinners and saints to his table. At that table, he invited the ordinary to become extraordinary. So we too invite all to Christ's table. Wherever you come from, whoever you are, however you believe in Jesus Christ, wherever you are going, come and be fed. Come and be refreshed. Come and be filled with life.
duress, took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance. In the same manner, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant, sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, the table is ready. we thank, give you thanks for this feast of your goodness and grace. As you have nourished us in Jesus Christ, send us forth to feed and serve others, sharing your peace with the whole community and showing your faithful love in the world. Through Jesus Christ, bread of life for all.
Our sending him is all hail the power of Jesus' name. Let us stand. to you this morning is to let is to be of the same mind in you that was in Christ to God be the glory the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore and all God's people said Amen, Amen. Amen.